Good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Can I ask everyone to please switch off their mobile devices or switch them to silent mode so that they don't affect the committee's work this morning? Apologies have been received for this morning's meeting from Alex Neil. Um, we expect that Kenny Gibson might join us, who is the committee substitute for the SNP. Item one, our first item today is to decide whether to take item four in private. Do members agree? Do members also agree to take the work programme that we will consider at our meeting on the 23rd of February in private also? Thank you. Item two, we will now take oral evidence on the Auditor General for Scotland report entitled the 2015-16 Audit of NHS Tayside. And I welcome to the meeting Paul Gray, Director General Health and Social Care and Chief Executive of the NHS in Scotland. I welcome Christine McLaughlin, Director of Health Finance and Fiona McQueen, Chief Nursing Officer of the Scottish Government. Mr Gray does not wish to make an opening statement this morning. So before we move to questions, I will reiterate... Is that correct, Mr Gray? And it is, although I would welcome the opportunity near the beginning of the uh, evidence to make a couple of comments on the letter that I submitted. I think it would be helpful for the committee to have a brief update on the position as set out there. If, if you can do that now, then that would be useful. Thank, Thank you. you. So when I wrote to the committee on the 27th of uh, January, um, I uh, gave a brief outline of the position on NHS Tayside and I, I have, as you would expect, had continued discussions with the Chair and the Chief Executive. And the particular issue I want to draw to the, the Committee's attention is that uh, Tayside remains committed to delivering its plan this year within the 11.7 million of brokerage which had been afforded to them. Uh, however, they are um, experiencing a bit of a time lag on the necessary culture change to bring about uh, the prescribing savings and I have uh, agreed to provide support from the Deputy Chief Medical Officer Dr Gregor Smith. The, the uh, prescribing savings are generally to be found in general practice and I want them to have all the support they can in order to ensure that that's achieved practically and in a way that doesn't affect patient care. That means that in order to meet the 11.7 million brokerage limit, uh, they will have to adopt uh, some contingencies. That was, uh, that, that's a sensible thing to do. However, I've asked to meet the chair and the chief executive at the beginning of March, uh, with, once my colleagues have gone through these contingencies with them, to ensure that none of what they are proposing to do will affect patient care. And if I conclude, that it would be sensible to advance a small amount of further brokerage, I will do so. I simply thought it was fair to let the committee know that. I haven't decided yet, but I wanted you to be aware that that was my current thinking. Well, that's very useful, Mr Gray. Thank you uh, very much indeed for informing the committee of, of that meeting and your uh, considered intentions. It, it leads me on to what I was going to ask to open up questioning initially, and it is about the current financial figures and clarity uh, around that. Can I reiterate the Auditor General's statement um, that NHS Tayside's finances were the most challenging position that she had seen? The Auditor General also made clear that the efficiency saving target for NHS Tayside in cash terms was unprecedented across Scotland. And today we're going to question how we have reached this position, the possible implications for the people who use services in Tayside and your role as the Scottish Government in making sure that this is properly addressed. But I would like to start questioning this morning by asking for clarity um, beyond what you've said as well on the current financial position at NHS Tayside, given, and I'm sure you've looked at the official report, Mr Gray, of the meeting we had with the Chief Executive, uh, the Chair and the Finance Director in Dundee in December. Uh, there were a number of 
figures there and, and not too much clarity around them. Can you confirm this morning that the savings NHS Tayside must make in this and subsequent financial years broken down into efficiency savings and repaying the Scottish Government's financial support, also known as brokerage? So I'll ask uh, Christine McLaughlin to give you the detail of that, the Finance Director. Um, the figure of £214 million has been quoted, and if we start from there, perhaps Christine could explain how that figure uh, is arrived at and any commentary that she would wish to offer on the components. Okay, so if I can start, but please feel free just to, to ask if anything I'm saying doesn't... Um it doesn't make sense or isn't, isn't clear enough. So Tayside's plans, you're right, for this um, current financial year, um, the, the position that we've agreed with them is um, that overall they had a, um, a, a, a gap between their expenditure programme and, the, and their income of just over £58 million. Um, they set themselves a savings target of what they thought was achievable to deliver against that of um, £46.75 million. Um, so that's just over 6.5%, so slightly above where um, the, the average for territorial boards. Can I clarify that initially? Was their initial savings target was 58 and then it was reduced to 46, is that correct? But, um, no, that, that's not... What, what they said initially was that in order to balance, they needed to make their system more efficient by um, £58.4 million. Pounds. Um, what they, they, they didn't have a plan to deliver all of that through savings. So, yes, in, in a straightforward example, in any other board, you would expect the board to come up with savings of that level. Um, and so there have been ongoing discussions with the board about the extent to which Scottish Government would provide brokerage to them. Um, I, I, I'm sure you want to ask questions about brokerage, but brokerage is not of itself an unusual thing for us to do. It's very much about smoothing funding over a number of years with boards, if there are particular reasons to do so. So we entered into the financial year on a, a planning assumption, if I can put it that way, of um, £11.65 million of support that we would provide to Tayside in year, recognising that we didn't believe that savings of a magnitude of, of £58 million were were, were realistic um, for NHS Tayside. So that's where the difference it isn't. That, that figure isn't as such that they slipped, it's that they never had a plan to deliver it. We did as much due diligence on their position as we could to understand what was reasonable, and we accepted um, a position of brokerage in, in year. So the question really in year is about the extent to which Tayside can deliver that £46.75 million pounds of savings, um, and what the, the way in which they deliver it, and what that means for their, um, their position over the next few years. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the, the first thing I would say about um, this current year. Quick that the um, NHS Tayside's own board papers in early December, I think, quoted that the deficit would run to 18 million rather than 11.65 or seven. Have um, as all boards, I would say this year, um, boards start with a plan on how they, they um, intend to achieve savings. Some of those savings are very clearly identified and, and will be plans that they have in place over a number of years, and others are, 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 are very much initial plans of, of targets that they ex expect to achieve. So, we've seen that Tayside, for instance, had a plan to reduce nurse agency costs in year. Um, and they have reduced significantly the agency costs in year. I think from uh, April to December, compared to the previous period, there is about a £750,000 reduction, but it hasn't gone as far as the, uh, the, the target for the year. Um, if you look at prescribing, as, um, as Paul Gray said, the, um, the, the savings that they hoped to make in, in prescribing, they haven't yet been able to make. So they're doing the work to put the plans in place. But it, it isn't a simple switch from one product to another. It's really about getting buy-in support from, from GP practices to change prescribing patterns. And so that's the work that we'll do some follow-up with them on to see whether, um, whether there is a way to go further and faster on prescribing savings. So, so the point in making there is that some areas have progressed, others have not gone as the board had planned. But like all boards, they've then looked at um, alternative savings options so the, the work that Tayside are doing just now that are in their board papers is about looking at where they could identify substitute savings, if you like, in year to compensate for that reduction. The point that Paul's making is that um, we, we need to see the extent to which those substitute savings and the options within it are ones that will 
cover um, the, the savings would have not made the, the targets and whether they're, um, that's acceptable okay. in terms of the actions they would take. So I think what you've just said to us is, before you started talking about prescribing there, you talked about the um, brokerage figures for this year. I'm, I'm keen to set out at the start of this meeting the um, savings that NHS Tayside must make in this year, but also subsequent financial years broken down into efficiency savings and repaying the loans to the Scottish Government. Do you have that breakdown for us? I can give you it verbally and I'm happy to back up anything Great. that I say in, in, in writing as well, because we have um, just quite simple um, documentation that, that can give you that. Um, so, the, <clears throat> so if I start with the savings, so it, the, this financial year, say savings were um, that we had agreed £46.75 million, pounds, which is about 6.6% .6 of their total funding. Um, as, as Tayside looked forward for the future years, the current plans um, for, for savings, so next financial year, they're looking at £45.8 million pounds of savings. Um, <clears throat> and I, I appreciate these figures might change slightly around the margins if you're looking at, for instance, December board papers, because they're really working through the detail of that just now, but the recent figures that, that Tayside have shared with me is 45.8 million of savings. Um, that's about 6.3%, so quite a similar set of circumstances next financial year to this financial year. Um, the current planning estimates further brokerage from us of four million pounds for next year. So Tayside don't see that the total amount they would need to get back into balance is achievable to turn that around in one year. Um, but the current plans assume then that going into 2018-19 that the board are back in financial balance in year, if you follow me. Um, and then we would put in place a repayment profile for the brokerage that, that they would have incurred up until that point in time. Um, so would, would, um, shall I continue taking you through the, the brokerage assumptions? So I think I would say, first of all, that the, the number one priority for us is Tayside getting back into sustainable financial balance in a way that um, keeps that balance with performance and their delivery targets as well. And so we have not yet pushed them on a precise number in each year for the brokerage repayment. So they're, they're illustrating what they think is possible, but we haven't yet come to a final decision on the, the repayment until we're absolutely satisfied in the measures to get them back into balance. Um, but that being said, the board are planning on four years of repayment of their brokerage. Um, which would be around about £35 million. Pounds. Now, if I can tell you that, that there are different ways in which they would achieve that position. Um, so the first thing to say is that they're, they're planning assumptions on the savings in year for those next four years is, is, just, is, is over 5.5%. It's about 5.7%. Um, so the first thing we would want to know is the extent to which that is realistic and what they would need to do to deliver that. But the actual repayment of brokerage itself, there, there are a few levers that Tayside have. Um, so they have a number of asset sales. Um, one thing that Tayside has is a, a lot of estate. Um, much of it is actually already vacant and, and on the market. So we, we have been um, worked with Scottish Futures Trust to get a fair assessment of the valuation of these assets. And we would, we would allow Tayside to, um, to use those asset sales to partly pay off their their brokerage to us. Um, normally those sales would come back to Scottish Government and would help towards the overall capital position, but we would allow Tayside to use them to offset some of their, their brokerage. Um, and the second thing I would say is that the um, <clears throat> you'd be familiar, familiar with the way in which we, we, we fund boards and that there's a funding formula. Um, and as a result of the, the policy to have boards within 1% of their funding formula, Tayside will receive an additional £8 million next financial year. Um, now, that £8 million pounds was not so something that the board were planning on. It was announced as part of the budget um, position in December. And so that is, that's £8 million pounds each year um, that the board will receive for which they were not planning. So those two factors together, I think, will, will help to make the, the notion of repaying over a four-year period more realistic than if they hadn't been there. Um, but, but it will be a combination of the board delivering more efficiency savings and using those mechanisms to repay. If I can just rewind to the first part of, sure. of that answer, the, the figures, and I know you're going to provide us with these you just committed to on paper, which would be really helpful. But just picking up on what you're saying, I think we got as far as year two 
was the 45.8 million, 6.3% for year two, is that correct? So, so that would be around 6.3%? Yes. So after that, yep. are you saying to the committee that the, um, you're not keen to press NHS Tayside on how much brokerage they will repay because they have to really work out how much they can save? Yes, so ideally at this point in time, yes, we would have all of that in, in place. But because of the scale of the challenge, I think it's right that we focus first and foremost on getting them back into financial balance. I think that the, the indicative plan they've got for the next five years, is, it feels reasonable. Um, but it is still pretty challenging to deliver that level of savings over that period of time. So the boards are assuming that in years two to four, they would make savings of £40 million each year, to put that in context. Ms McLaughlin, we uh, discussed this in detail at the committee meeting in December in Dundee. And I think we established then that actually what was required by NHS Tayside was a detailed plan over the next uh, five years yes. that would actually identify where the savings were going to come from. I understand that the Scottish Government, you don't want to you know, you're leaving the brokerage op, uh, open because obviously this is about services. And, mm. But it was our understanding as a committee and we anticipate getting from NHS Tayside towards the end of March their detailed five-year plan year by year on where their savings are come from, or will come from. So is what you're saying today that we've really only so far got as far as year two on that plan? No, th there is a plan, and, and within the board's um, transformational change programme, they have detailed a, a finance plan that, that supports that, and it delivers against those numbers that I've said. It goes out to 2021-22, um, and it details the, the, the main work streams, um, so where they expect to get in relation to nurse agency, medical locums, prescribing, um, where, where they expect to get to in relation to their asset base. So there is a level of detail there that gives me comfort over the five years. All I'm saying is that landing on these precise figures over a five-year period of time is a level of accuracy that um, at this point in time, I, I feel that we need to do more diligence on it, but there is most certainly a five-year plan in place for Tayside that sees them at the end of that being in balance and having repaid the, the brokerage to the Scottish Government. I mean, I think we all understand on this committee the areas of problems and where they're aiming to make cost efficiencies from agency costs, from uh, prescribing costs. But what we were looking for was more detail. Are you saying that that detailed plan year by year over the next five years from NHS side, are you saying that that kind of detail isn't possible? So it's, I think it's just it's more detailed in the earlier years, um, and that's not unlike the situation in other boards. So, so there's a very detailed plan that gives me assurance about um, next financial year. The, the savings in, in the future years are predicated on continuing with those, those types of trajectories. Um, so there is, there is a plan there. I think that the, 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 the latter three years are less detailed, but they're very much about continuing with delivery of the, the transformational change programme. Um, but we, uh, the other thing I would say is that by the end of March, we will have the local delivery plan for NHS Tayside, um, as we would do for all of the, the boards. And that's where I expect to see the real detail on that coming through. So, so that's a document that um, we've asked for the, the early site of the draft financial plan by the end of February um, and the full local delivery plan by the end of March. Um, so that's where I would really look to see all of the the further detail in their plan. Okay. You did say there that the Scottish Government has agreed with NHS Tayside that the money that they will release from capital receipts from sale of their assets will go towards paying back brokerage. Now, that is a non-recurring uh, saving, which NHS Tayside has been uh, very reliant on. Does that mean, in the discussions that you've had and the agreement that you've reached with them, that the general savings uh, that they have to make will all come from recurring savings? So the, the board just now, so the first answer is it, it, obviously in relation to those asset sales, um, Tayside over a number of years has relied on that non-recurring um, means through asset sales. That will obviously only take you so far. So there's somewhere between 10 and 15 million pounds of future 
asset sales that are planned over that five-year period. Um, and, and they've been revised to be quite prudent estimates um, for Tayside. So, so you're right in that we would then be looking for savings to be genuine efficiencies within the system. Um, NHS Tayside right now are running at a ratio of about 60-40, so 60% being non-recurrent. Non um, their, their plans over the five years get them back into, into a situation of 60% recurring um, by 2021. So they are looking to get that, that balance shifting, um, but, it, but it's not a situation of overall recurrency of all of their savings. Um, now, we wouldn't expect any board to have all of their savings recurring. It's not being the, the way that boards have operated. They've always measures, which are one-off measures that you can take in any system. But I think getting back into that balance of 60% um, recurring would feel a much healthier place for NHST site to be. So we do have that, I do have that level of detail and that level of assurance from the planning that's been done so far in NHS Tayside. Okay. Thank you very much. Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I, was, uh, I was interested um, and, and reassured to a point that the Scottish Government are um, happy with the way planning is going. I think certainly you sound a lot more reassured than the Auditor General did in her report. Um, can I just ask about the eight million that you spoke about just now and Paul Gray said in his um, submission to the committee that the, it, it's part of the NRAC funding to take the board within the 1% parity. Would they not have been getting that anyway to take them within the 1%? I'll go briefly and then Christine will come in. Um, they were not anticipating it, so the, the, the point is that they had done their planning up to that point, not anticipating receiving the eight million. So this is eight million of additional flexibility that they now have, and therefore we would expect that they would give priority to using that eight million in ways that either um, defray uh, any brokerage that they have or um, meet other pressures in the system. So it's 8 million more than they were expecting. The 8 million took them to the target of 1% from party. If they didn't get the 8 million, they wouldn't have been within the 1%. Is that correct? Absolutely right. Okay. Um, I just want to make a point about... Um, Paul Gray, in your opening statement, you said about the not meeting the prescribing savings. I think that that's really important that NHS Tayside are actually fronting up, if you like, and saying, look, we're trying and we're not quite getting there. And I think that, not to say that maybe that has been missing in the past, but it's really, really important to get to the stage where we want them to get to, is to be honest about how they're going to get there. And when um, we were in... Dundee in December, as the convener has already mentioned, um, we talked about the transformation five-year plan. We've already touched on that just now. Um, the delivery plan, the financial plan, there's, there's quite a few plans. Um, Christine McLaughlin, you said that the draft financial plan is coming to you at the end of February and the operational plan is at the end of March. How can you be absolutely sure at this point, without having seen that detail, that things are going the way you want them to go? So, so that's um, that, that's a is partly judgment as well. So, um, I think as you would expect, myself and other members of um, Scottish government have been working very, very closely with Tayside over this year and been um, going into a lot more detail than we would with with other boards. So, um, it, it is it, what, what I'm looking for is assurance that the things co components are in place that you would expect to see. Um, so. When I ask for things like run rates on monthly expenditure, are they going in the right in the right direction? So, it's those types of things that give a level of assurance. Um, but, but as with with any other part of the NHS, there are other pressures that come into a system um, that that can um, compensate for something that's going in the right direction. So, it's trying to understand the overall position within Tayside and the extent to which they're able to keep going with that total programme of which there are lots of different components within that plan um, and so whilst I'm saying that, that we'll get the detailed financial plans in, in February we already have in front of me their transformational change plan and their operational plan that supports it which has detail on the five years um, but the question really is the extent to which the plans are, are, are realistic and achievable given 
the, that it is, it is a very large, it's a comprehensive um, plan over a number of different areas. But, but if you step back and look at the, the overall um, operating model and the cost base, and I know that others have mentioned this in previous um, discussions with you about Tayside, they are, in, in some particular areas of cost, their expenditure is higher than in other parts of the system, and relative to their size, um, it would suggest that there, it's, it's reasonable to assume that they could come back into line with the average across other territorial boards without having a detrimental impact on their service. But, but these things need time to work through how you, how you implement them in a, in a logical um, manner that, that maintains performance, and that, that's what our focus has been, has been on as we go through it. Um, but, but there are a number of different metrics that Tayside have looked at themselves in their benchmarking to give clear indication of um, a cost base that's higher than other boards. Um, just to touch on that subject then, the, the, the cost base is higher and we've looked at the prescribing and the staff numbers, the agency nurses. Why did we get to this position if they knew that these costs were, were higher than other, than other boards? How, 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 how are we here now? So, again, I'll bring Christine in. The point about benchmarking is to bring out these, uh, these comparators, and there are some cost variations which are reasonable. Um, a, a rural board will have a different set of cost pressures in some areas from uh, an urban or city-based board. Um, also, uh, Tayside have designed their services in particular ways, so the way that they've designed their service around a &E, for example, is producing very high performance indeed, but that comes with a cost. Um, now, the, 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 the point for us is not simply to dump, jump to the conclusion that every time someone's costs are higher than someone else's, that the one who's high is wrong. However, on, in the case of Tayside, there are some elements, and we've spoken about um, agency, use of agency staff, where we believe that that uh, level of being out of alignment is sufficiently significant to be worth paying attention to, similarly on prescribing. Um, and I think that NHS Tayside's current leadership, having taken, having taken a really good, hard look at the way that their budgets were being set up and delivered, has brought to the surface um, some issues which the, 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 the committee is already aware of around um, asset sales and so forth, which really caused them to think very hard about the, uh, the way in which they were delivering services. What we're doing, uh, through our overall approach to efficiency is ensuring that all boards ha not only have access to and sight of that information about benchmarking, but that where boards are outliers, they are looking carefully at th these areas to determine whether they ought to be bringing them more within the norms. That's what Tayside is doing. I think that's the right approach. I completely take your point about rural v city health boards and nobody's saying that they have to run in exactly the same way, it would be impossible. But to say that um, just because one has higher costs that that might be the wrong way to run things, surely the alarm bells start ringing when you need to get bailed out by the Scottish Government in consecutive years, time after time. So just because their costs are higher, you're right, doesn't mean that this service that they're providing is the wrong one. Um, considering that the Scottish Government has provided so much financial support to NHS Highland, um, does that mean that other places in the Scottish Government's budget has missed out? Where would that money have been spent otherwise? I said the, the, the um, use of brokerage as a way of smoothing out funding is something that, that we have used over um, a, a, a number of years. So, so we do factor into our budget planning an element of um, support, and, and that's often two ways, so it's, it's board repaying support as well as receiving support. So the parameters in which we're working are ones that are within our, our planning assumptions. So in short, um, brokerage is something that's fully managed within the, the health um, budget. Okay. Um, and if, as you say, and I think it's completely the right approach, that the, the Scottish Government um, takes the opinion that the, the brokerage can only be paid once NHS Tayside is, and well, I use the term financially sustainable. Um, what, what does financially sustainable look like? Is it breaking even? Yeah, it means that they can break even and deliver the efficiency savings year on year 
without recourse to further brokerage and maintain the appropriate levels of service and delivery. So would you take the approach that they would um, repay the, or, or, or achieve the efficiency savings and then start to repay the brokerage? Or would you do both at the same time? I mean, obviously, we want it to be affordable and we, we want to make sure that there's no diminution of services to, to the people that are using it. I would expect, and this is, this is what I would expect, I'm not giving you an absolute commitment that this is what will happen, that the trajectory of repayment of brokerage would grow over time. And so in other words, I would not expect to just say, well, you're going to break even in two years' time, therefore there'll be a flat rate return or you'll have to repay it all in one year. I would expect us to agree a trajectory. Some of that would be informed by the likely timing of asset sales, as Christine McLaughlin has said. Um, so what we're seeking to do here is to be as flexible as we can to make sure that we don't implement or impose a transformation plan, a recovery plan that, that simply imposes further burdens on Tayside and makes it harder. Okay, thank you. Can I clarify a couple of, of points on that, please? We, we received oral evidence from NHS Tayside saying we'll be back in financial balance within five years of our five-year plan. But it seems to be what you're saying to us today is that you expect us to be back in financial balance at the end of year one? So, so we, we've been having discussions about what is, is reasonable with mm. Tayside. Um, so the, offer, the starting point was within five years. What we, we wanted to understand the extent to which that was about being um, back in, in financial balance in year and also about the extent to which re uh, brokerage was repaid. So taking into account all of those factors on asset sales, the additional um, NRAC funding, um, the, the indicative programme just now that we're working to is, is a gradual repayment. So, so in 2018-19, it would be less than £2 million, but it would just start that, that repayment. Um, so so you know, going back to your earlier point, yes, it is a, a mix of delivering efficiency savings and starting to repay. Um, now, my, my, my caution, is you like, if you like, is that we need to really understand um, where, where Tayside, um, the, the assumptions that they're making within that, to understand that that's, that's reasonable. But their indicative position just now goes from 1.6 million um, up to nearly 12 million in 2020. So there's, there's a range in there that's largely back-ended to get back to, to repayment. Um, but we, we will push, and, and I would say that I've been challenging to the board to come up with something that is as early as possible, but trying to get that, that balance that um, what isn't helpful for any of us is to agree something <coughs> that, is, that is beyond what the board can deliver and then need to provide more brokerage. So we would rather try to get it right just now. But, but there is an indicative plan of a repayment that would see it phase and be back-ended towards the end of the five years. Okay, so do I understand that you're really pushing, as Scottish Government, to have them back in financial health, breaking even by the end of year two? Um, that, that's, that's the position that I'm in with Tayside just okay. now, that we're, we are working on the extent to which it's potential for them to be back in balance in 2018-19 um, and start to repay brokerage. NHS Tayside said to us that the Scottish Government had agreed that their five-year plan is a credible plan and they are happy to support it. Is that correct? So they are continuing to develop the, the financial side of that in terms of that, that repayment. So if you just even take into account the fact that in each of the, the next four years they will have £8 million more NRAC funding, you know, that in itself is £32 million over the four years that, that, that wasn't in the previous plan sorted out by the end of year two, though, and they're saying we need five years to sort this out. So, so they are saying they need five years to, to fully implement their transformational change programme. It's absolutely not in doubt. It's a, it's a five-year programme. The extent that my um, challenge with them is the extent to which they can be back into to being um, able to live within their means and at what point they can do that and clearly my preference would be for that to be as early as it possibly can be. Much of what you've said to us this morning Ms McLaughlin has been, correct me if I'm wrong, predicated on the information you're getting from NHS Tayside and what they're saying to you about what's possible and what's yeah. not and what, what their plans are and what they're doing. Have you and the Scottish Government carried out your own evaluation 
to ensure that the NHS Tayside plan will not detrimentally affect services to patients? So, the short answer, uh, convener, is, is yes. And that's what one evidence of that is the fact that I have concluded that I want to meet the chair and the chief executive at the beginning of March to get that further level of assurance. We are not simply taking paper copies of plans, reading them and saying that that, that will do. Our, uh, Christine is in regular contact uh, and is in Tayside from time to time. John Conaghan, our chief operating officer, is also not just in contact, but there. Um, we are not taking... John Conaghan to there to help them sort no, of no. sorry convener uh, I, I, what I mean is that John Conaghan goes to Tayside to see what's happening on the ground as opposed to simply receiving assurances um, that's normal when we're providing tailored support to boards as we are to to Tayside um, so we are treading that line between having confidence in, in, in the senior leadership of Tayside, which is right and appropriate for us to do, and it also assuring ourselves, because as accountable officer for the whole of the budget, I need that assurance that what they are doing is credible and soundly based. And I think we're, we're, you know, we're, we're seeking to adopt that balance. Tayside are right to say that we have confidence in what they have produced so far, that is absolutely right. If we didn't have confidence, I'd be sitting here with a different narrative for you. But we still want to build that confidence further because what they are seeking to do is not straightforward. It is, you know, transformation will change. If it was easy, we would all have done it by now. Um, what, they are, what they are being asked to do and what they are trying to do, rightly, is not straightforward. Mr Gray, is, the, is NHS Tayside the only NHS board in Scotland in debt to the Scottish Government? No, it's not, and Christine can give you the details on that. So, so this financial year we have um, three boards receiving brokerage. Um, so we have Tayside, as we've discussed, Ayrshire and Arran. Um, current plan is, is around £11 million pounds brokerage for Ayrshire and Arran, and five current plan is 4.8 million pounds in brokerage um, and so we're going through similar processes with those boards the, the difference clearly is that the Tayside position has been one that's been ongoing for a number of years for those two other boards this is the first year of receiving um, financial brokerage um, and so we're working through that um, next five years with both of those boards board NHS Tayside is the only board that's had to come back year on year for brokerage and it has the highest debt to the Scottish Government, is that right? That, that's correct. I mean, in the past we have had <coughs> other boards that have had multiple years um, of brokerage that, that's then been repaid. So it's a model that, that has, has worked in the past. But if I can confirm, the, the cumulative um, outstanding brokerage is now £67.9 million at the end of this year. You, you're aware of the situation with the NHS 24 as well, where there is outstanding brokerage. That's in cumulative across the boards. That, that's correct. Yes. So with NHS Tayside's total being 36, is that right? So with that, that's based on their um, <coughs> 11.7 £11.7 this year, which would be £31.5 million in total. So if I factor that in, and I can provide all this for you so that you can see okay. the, the detail. But yeah, so there, that, there is a discrepancy between that 31 and a half and the 36 that John Connell said he thought would be owed? The, 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 the difference is the extent to, to which there's additional brokerage next financial year. Right. So the board is planning on £4 million of additional brokerage next okay. financial year. So that's the difference, sorry. So based on that total plan by next year, there would be another £4 million. What would be the implications of waiving the brokerage? So, so brokerage is a, um, it is a kind of um, self uh, it, it, it's a mechanism that we've put in place for the NHS to, to, to smooth and to recognise the fact that, it, that it, it can be quite challenging for any, any large organisation to land on a, a balanced position in every financial year. So um, our approach has been that that is about smoothing and therefore it is, it, it is recovered at a later date. Um, there have been a couple of instances in the past for particularly some of the island boards where we have um, not sought to recover Funds. What I would say is that they have been much smaller in value and related to genuine one-off issues such as very high cost patients being dealt with off-island. Um, the set of circumstances in Tayside are very much about issues that feel like they're the responsibility and accountability of NHS Tayside and I think that's why we started with the approach of looking to um, 
to, to have that smoothed over a period of time with the board and the board repay. Is it something the Scottish Government would consider, given the... I mean, it is quite a serious situation. And so I, I suppose, Convener, what, what I would uh, remind the committee of is the concession we've already uh, made to Tayside, that their asset sales will not be returned to central funds. So, I mean, we could take their asset sales back and then uh, not ask them to def defray the brokerage, but it seems more straightforward and frankly more transparent to make that concession, to make it visible and, and to be a way of supporting them. I, I think, however, uh, from my perspective, I would want boards to understand generally that where we provide brokerage, we expect it to be returned. It is part of prudent financial management. We are not going to let a board go to the wall simply to prove a point about their financial management, but nor are we going to allow them to get into a position where they can simply assume that there will be a, a, a central recovery fund of some kind, simply because there isn't, and because we plan on the basis of spending that money. So it has been done before. It's not something you would want or seek, but you're saying it's not off the table. I think I've made clear that we've already made a concession to Tayside, which I think is a, an appropriate concession. From my perspective as accountable officer, I would not at this time wish to go further. If uh, circumstances arose that caused me to reconsider, I don't think one ever says never, but I think I'm drawing a very clear line that it is not my expectation. Thank you. Monica Lennon. Convener, on Asset sales, you've brought us up to date this morning and explained that <coughs> a concession has been made not to return um, those sales to central funds. In December, we did explore this issue with the, the witnesses and the savings, I think, they detailed were going to be around about 7.6 million, which I think is lower than the figure that, that Christine McLaughlin referred to today. Um, our concern has been that they're not having a lot of success with the, the properties that they're trying to dispose of. Does Christine McLaughlin have a, an update on any sales that have been made since December? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, 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 can, I can do two things. I can give you an update and I can send you Tayside's own detail of the, the status of all, all of their sales, because that's what I look for is not just a number, but what, what, what is that made up of and where are the risks? So, so there, there are a number of properties. There's a, <clears throat> in any sale, there's the extent to which there's the value that sits on your books and there's the potential for profit. So the, the, the uncertainty that I don't think any board can give with absolute um, guarantee is the extent to which there's any profit on, on sale. Um, so the, the, the schedule that we've got of a number of properties it adds up to 30 sites in total. Um, and so there's a lot a lot in there in their, in their plans. So I'm basing the, what I've said based on the um, current book values and, and estimates on profits over that period of time. But I, I would fully accept that there is a range within that. Um, there's a range both in terms of the absolute value and also in terms of the timing of sales. You know, it's not uncommon sometimes for properties to be in the market for a number of years before they're sold and, and often different agreements about um, even in a sale when they actually realise the um, the return on that. But well, there is a level of confidence that I take also from having um, an organisation like Scottish Futures Trust reviewing the, um, the reasonableness of the plans within Tayside and they've given us that assurance too. Well, Lindsay Bedford, the Director of Finance, um, told us in his evidence that they were looking to dispose of up to 14 properties by the end of March. So given that we're now into February, do you have any idea, given that you've got up-to-date lists, if they have managed to sell any of these properties since we were told this in, in December? It seems to me to, is, is to get an up-to-date position from Tayside and, and come back to you. But certainly the information that's in front of me would say that there's a number of properties currently under offer and a number sold. So I can just get an up-to-date position from Tayside and give you exactly where they are and what the values are. There's, there's nothing that I'm aware of that's a, 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 a further risk to their year-end position based on asset sales at this point in time. Okay. I mean, you are aware that 13 of the properties had been on the market for more than a year at that time, and three had been on the market for more than four years. So, 
whilst it sounds like a generous concession to make in terms of asset sales return, not returning to central funds, we're not really hearing that any properties are being disposed of. And in fact, the one offer that had been received was considerably low, below market value. So what confidence are we to take from this minimal update today? Um, so I think I would say two things to you. One is, is that the, so this is partly about market forces and, and sales value that they'll get. So what I'm looking for is, it, is it a reasonable estimate that the board are making? Um, they have significantly revised down their estimates on asset sales since 2014-15. Um, and and the, the values that they had in previously were much higher than they're currently estimating because they've tried to be more prudent. But clearly that's the issue about the timing of repayment of brokerage that, that we do want to link it to the actual sales being being realised. So I think you're correct to, to flag that there are some, some difficult sites within the board's geographical area that, that, um, that have been on the market for some time, but they're still actively pursuing sales on those sites. I see there are a number that are under offer, but I'm happy to give you further detail on that. And, and these sites, are these all vacant buildings or are any of these properties currently in use? So the, so the ones that we're talking about just now are all, are all vacant um, from the list that I'm looking at, there's there's almost all that are either vacant um, buildings or their land sales. Okay. But I can I happy I to provide all of that a, detail. A, a detailed schedule, perhaps you could provide that to the committee. I'll, I'll I'll do that. I'll work with the board because it, it will be their detail about where they are with it. But I'll do okay. that and and I'll give you some information from the reviews that we've had done okay. on their asset position from Scotland. Just Street lastly, on assets, are you able today to give us an up to date figure on what the the current estimate on expected receipts is? Has that changed since we met the board? And I, I'm not aware of anything that significantly changed the position on, on receipts, but I can confirm that. There's nothing that's been flagged to me by the board that is a further risk to their year-end position, is what I would, I would say right now in terms of their, their planning for 16-17. I think the, the point that we're trying to make is more about the potential for the future sales over the next four to five years. If I may, convener, as I already said, I spoke both to the chair and the chief executive yesterday, and asset sales were, were, were not among the issues that they raised with me. So I, I know that's, a, 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 if you like, a bit of a negative resolution. They did raise other issues that were causing them concern, principally pharmacy. I would have expected, had asset sales been a concern, they would have raised them, and they didn't. So I think I, I support what Christine McLaughlin is saying. At present, we've no evidence to suggest that there'll be a problem with asset sales this year to the extent that they will, uh, they're, they're already planning to make them. And also just to point out, I, I realise your concern about the concession, but it, it's not a one-off. Th this concession I have, that we have given to Tayside applies for the period of the repayment of brokerage. So if they sell properties in five years' time, they'll still get the benefit from them. What are the other issues, issues that were raised apart from pharmacy, Mr Gray? Mm -hmm. The, well, the, the, the issue of what contingency they might then deploy, and of course one of the contingencies a board can deploy would be to slow down the rate of treating people in some areas, for example. That's what I want to discuss with them, whether um, and how they will deploy some of these contingencies. There may, may be some uh, that are appropriate and some that are not, and I just want to be sure about that. Does that mean longer waiting lists? Well, yes. I mean, let's, you know, let's not beat about the bush. Of course it would. It would mean that somebody who might have been treated at the end of March might not be treated until April. So that potentially would mean that there would be more breaches of the legal treatment guarantee time? Well, not necessarily. If someone was due to be treated within six weeks and it was moved out to eight, that still wouldn't breach the guarantee. So, and that's the sort of thing that I want to discuss with them in more detail when, you know, when they've worked that through. That I, I, I don't want to speculate here because I have given them the opportunity to go away and consider it and I want to give them that space to do so and to come back to me at the beginning of March as we've agreed. Colin Beattie. <coughs> Mr Gray, during our uh, evidence taking in December, um, we received some fairly damning uh, written submissions. And I'll, I'll just quote from them. Uh, this is the Royal College of Nursing. A lack of long-term planning and oversight leading to financial crises. The culture within NHS Tayside has tended to be top-down and divisive. The management's been bullying towards members of staff. Breakdown between management and staff working in partnership. 
vicious circle of disengagement, distrust and disempowerment. It, it doesn't sound very good. Is there not clearly uh, evidence of mismanagement and fiscal irresponsibility within NHS Tayside? Is the current team there capable of, of affecting the cultural change that you're expecting? Because it seems that there's an awful lot of work here to be done. I don't see historically, after five years of, I think it's five years now of support from the Scottish Government by way of brokerage, we're still seeking solutions. Is there, is, is there not a message there? So, as I've said, we're providing tailored support to NHS Tayside, and I have also said, and I, I, I said it this morning, and I repeat, w w were my position to be that I did not have confidence in the leadership of NHS Tayside, I would be having a different conversation with the committee this morning. Um, I was disappointed to see these submissions. Uh, I entirely respect the right of these organisations to put them forward. What I would say is that I was at the NHS Tayside Annual Review in 2015 uh, when industrial relations were at a low point. I think that was widely understood and acknowledged. We provided considerable support to Tayside. Um, Norman Proven of the Royal College of Nursing uh, was uh, instrumental, I would say, in supporting uh, development of a better culture between the staff side and the management side of the Area Partnership Forum. When I was at the uh, annual review in 2016 with Maureen Watt, the Area Partnership Forum meeting, which is routinely part of the annual review, was a completely different place and a much better atmosphere. The uh, employee director uh, said that there had been considerable improvement and it was, it was frankly detectable in the room. Um, I spoke to a number of the staff side representatives informally afterwards and was encouraged by what I heard. I think that the RCN material which they put forward was based on a survey taken early on in that process of improving relationships in Tayside. And I understand that there has been further work since that submission uh, and that that trajectory of improvement continues. I am not claiming that, in, that the relationship between the staff side and the management side in Tayside is absolutely perfect. It is not. They all acknowledge that. I think that there has been improvement and I think that improvement is being sustained. Um, and I think that has required considerable effort from both the management side and the staff side. Uh, and I uh, am assured that that is continuing. But do you consider, given the evidence in front of this committee of the way the finances have been handled and the way the situations have been managed, are they up to the job? Have they not already proven that they cannot do it? No, they have not. What they have done is to make... what what. John Connell and Leslie McClay and others have done is to make transparent some issues which were in the accounts. The accounts were given uh, an unqualified uh, rating each year, so they're, they're, they have not had qualified accounts. And I believe that the actions they've taken, particularly around some assumptions that were made around two asset sales that were purportedly, uh, or two assets which were purportedly worth 22 million and had to be written down, which was quite a big hit on the books. I think the way they've tackled these and been transparent about them has actually been the right approach. And my, con my concern, Mr. Beattie, I think it's very fair of you to raise these points. I don't object to them at all. Um, but my concern is that I wouldn't like a message to go around health boards that, 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 that being transparent is somehow going to get them into um, more bother than being not transparent. I'm very much promoting transparency here, um, and I believe that what Tay Tra said have sought to do is to be transparent. That probably means that more of their problems become visible, but that is what transparency is about. In, the in any functioning health service in the developed world, the more transparent you are, the more readily you fix problems and the more readily you improve. Transparency is to be welcomed, and it, it, but this is not about uh, a box-ticking exercise and making sure that your accounts are right. There's more to it than this. There's quality of management and the fact that over a period of a number of years, 
Uh, they have failed to make the books balance. There's been so, there's so many issues within this. I mean, we're talking about uh, higher costs in almost every area at one point compared to other health boards. How have they allowed it to get into that sort of situation? Surely, we knew, surely they knew about this. I mean, they've had their cap out asking the government to put money in now for some time. Not long after the Chief Executive was appointed, Leslie McClay, um, she and I had a discussion about her concerns about the state of the finances, and she then undertook a number of steps, including external support and review. Um, these things take time. They're also working, at, say, on pharmacy, on culture change. That takes time. What I'm trying to do and, and seeking to convey to the committee today is to be flexible about the brokerage and flexible about the repayment of it so that we don't simply load further pressure onto them to make it harder to inst institute the recovery they need to make. I believe they are taking this very seriously. Indeed, we are putting in considerable support. Um, and I, I believe that Tayside have, as we have said, a plan that is so far credible. It, you know, in the absence of all of these things, of course I wouldn't have confidence in management, but in the presence of them, I think I'm entitled to do so. Given the fact that uh, the management are going to have to deliver some fairly um, eye-watering savings over the next few years, and given the past history where the savings that they have achieved have been such a high proportion non-recurring, I mean, this, it really is a big worry, and their past history has not indicated they can deliver. Why suddenly are they going to transform themselves and be able to deliver over the next few years? Because unlike in the past, I am seeing now trajectories where there is improvement, and I think that's the difference. I think that's the key difference. If, if, we, were simply, if we were simply living on a further set of promises, then... Um, I, I would be deeply concerned, but on the staffing, we are seeing improvement. We are seeing them not just hoping that they might be able to do something about pharmacy costs, but when they are encountering difficulties, coming and asking for help with that. That, to me, is the right approach. That, that's what I'm encouraging boards to do, not to become isolated. I think, it's, I think it is actually an act of leadership to accept that you need help with something rather than just to battle on, hopefully, in, 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 in anticipation of achieving a result. It seems to have taken them an awful long time to get round to that, though. But moving on to, to something Monica, Monica Lennon was talking about, we, there's a number of properties out there that are empty. And when we had took evidence previously, as of March 2016, there was 24, I think. Um, I raised the question at the evidence session about how much it was costing actually to secure these properties. Mm. And I wonder if we might get an update on that because there is a real cost. The, the, the properties must be getting guarded and secured. There must be a cost in maintaining them to some minimal extent. Do we have, do you have a figure for that? We'll certainly provide that in the written update, uh, Mr. Beatty, but do you have anything you I, want to I, add to I, that? I don't have it to hand, but I can give you, I'll, I can give you the information on the status of the buildings, so the ones that are vacant, the ones that are purely land sales and, and the cost of maintenance, but I don't have that to hand. I'll send that to you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gray, in response to Colin uh, Beatty's question about your confidence in the management team and, and the board, I mean, you, you said to us already this morning that you're having to go back in a couple of weeks' time because they are not, you're saying the trajectories are good, but actually they're not going to meet their targets this year. So, how can you have this sustained confidence if already they're coming back to you and saying, actually, we're having problems meeting targets for this year? Well, convener, I, I want to put this carefully because I, 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 I completely understand the committee, the importance the committee attaches to scrutinising this appropriately. But I, I suspect if you scrutinised any board's five-year plan once every couple of months, you would find it had bumps in it. You know, it, it, it wouldn't all just go in a positive direction. Most of it would, and some of it wouldn't, and then there would be contingency and recovery. That, you know, that's the way, um, that's the way any health system is managed. What gives me confidence is the existence of a plan, 
the positive trajectories we're already seeing and the fact that the Chair and the Chief Executive are openly willing to discuss the areas where they need further help. You're starting to see positive trajectories, yeah. despite the fact you're going back up there in a couple of weeks' time that they're not meeting current targets. But what about the last three or four years where this situation has been allowed to escalate? What's been the Scottish, what's been your role in that over the past three or four years? So, um, my role has been, first of all, to uh, support the Chief Executive with, with others in ensuring that she had the necessary resources to review the, the accounts. Um, we provided external support through Alan Gall, who is now working full-time uh, for the board. Um, m my approach has been to ensure that they've had access to uh, our finance director, to John Conaghan, as the chief operating officer, uh, and to ensure that they did produce a plan which we could then review. So they have, they have a transformational plan, they have an operational delivery plan. These are all things that they didn't have before. They have them now. And, and it's only been in the last, what, six months to a year. So it was important for the chief executive to understand the scale and nature of the problem she was dealing with before she tried to produce a plan to deal with it. I think... Done before that point. Well, that's why she had the external support. I'm not suggesting she can't understand things. What, I'm, what I am suggesting, and I think your question's a fair one, is as I would have done... When faced with an issue, I wanted to be sure that I had got to the bottom of it before trying to develop a plan to resolve it. Otherwise, you end up trying to resolve something that you, com you, you incompletely understand. I think my, what I'm trying to get at is your involvement, correct me if I'm wrong, seems to have been ramped up over the past six months to a year to help NHS Tayside get out of this situation. But this is the fourth year now that they've had to come to the Scottish Government for brokerage. Scottish Government was aware of this escalating situation at NHS Tayside. So should there not have been much closer involvement at an earlier stage so we don't get to this situation? I mean, Mr Gray, my benchmark for this is that there's no effect to patient services and to jobs in Tayside. And what we've already heard today is that there is going to be an effect to patient services because you admitted that waiting lists are going to lengthen. So what was the Scottish Government's role in the past three or four years in preventing this? So, first of all, I've said that one of the contingencies that they could adopt might be to do that. I didn't say they would, and that's why I've said I want to discuss with them what the options are and to decide what support we should provide. Christine can give you more detail on some of the support that's been provided, but um, we have a ladder of escalation, as I've explained. Um, the ramping up is moving up the ladder of escalation. That's why we have it and that's what we use it for. Uh, so we've, we've not simply sat by and waited, but when we have had clear indications that more support was needed, we've provided that. We provided, for example, support some time ago from the Chief Medical Officer when there was a concern over A&E and other aspects uh, within uh, Nine Wells. Um, the Chief Nursing Officer has been providing support. We've, I, I don't want to go into some kind of self-justifying speech. I understand the question you're asking. My response is we've used our ladder of escalation and then when you move up a step, you move up a step. That's what we've done. I think there's sufficient financial expertise in the leadership team. I mean, I'm aware that John Connell said the finance director had been appointed recently, but the finance director has been in the organisation for 33 years. Do you think some fresh financial eyes are needed there? I think we have provided external support on finance, and if uh, Tayside require more external support, we'll provide it, but they appointed their finance director through fair and open competition. He, must therefore be judged to be the right person for the job. Um, I discussed with the Auditor General, as you probably would expect me to do, whether uh, she had any concerns about uh, the capability of the leadership in NHS Tayside based on her findings, and she was able to give me the assurance that she did not. So, um, I, I have, you know, I don't just walk past these things and hope for the best. I take it seriously and I have done so.
So you have confidence in the whole team that they will reach that financial sustainability by the end of year two, as Mrs McLaughlin outlined? I have confidence that they are taking the steps to do so. I think, as Ms McLaughlin has also outlined, we're not going to press them to do something unsustainable simply for the sake of meeting a particular point in time. Uh, I believe at the moment they're on a trajectory, a trajectory to meet financial sustainability within year two and to repay brokerage by the end of year five while remaining financially sustainable. But if in the course of our further conversations with them, or indeed in the course of time that passes later, something unexpected happens, we'll adjust accordingly. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that what we agree on the 31st of March is absolutely going to be what happens in every detail five years down the line. I, I don't know any, of any health system that could say that. Mm. But they're, they're the right team for the job. Sorry? They're the right team for the job. They are indeed. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. I'd like to explore a couple of issues arising from the last few questions. The external auditor of NHS Tayside uh, said, as far as I'm aware, no one at the board has been held to account for anything that has happened in the past. And when we heard from NHS Tayside, they were clear that they felt the current situation arose <coughs> Uh, because of a substantial number of years of operational models that didn't recognise the true financial situation NHS Tayside was in. Uh, and they balanced the books in a way that meant they were in financial balance when in fact it was living out with its means. Do you consider that any senior staff have been sufficiently held to account for these failings? Well, I'm holding the chair and the chief executive to account, as you would expect at the present. But it's a bit more difficult to comment on how one might hold to account people who aren't there. Where have they gone? Well, the current chief executive took, took up post two and a half years ago, so... But had been working in a very senior role prior to that with NHS Tayside, no? As Chief Operating Officer, I, I wouldn't hold my Chief Operating Officer to account for the financial performance of the NHS. And the Finance Director, who'd been there for 33 years? Well, he wasn't the Finance Director until about six months ago. So he wasn't accountable until six months ago? Well, no, simply. I mean, I'm... I, I mean, I'm the accountable officer for the NHS, and I have been since December 2013. So are you accountable for the situation that NHS takes out in, Mr Gray? I'm accountable for the whole of the NHS budget, and I have said that to this committee before, and I, I continue to be so. So are you comfortable that whoever is accountable for the situation that NHS Tayside finds itself in uh, has been sufficiently held to account? Well, I, I... Or are you unable to answer the question? I'm unable to answer the question, Mr Kerr, because I'm, I, I can hold to account those who are currently there. Uh, but, but you've been looking after this since 2013. That's right. And so what's happened to the people who were on the ground, as it were, since 2013, where are they? Do you mean the, the chief executive or...? I, I mean the people who are accountable, in your view, for the situation which NHS Tayside finds itself in. So the chief executive is the current accountable officer, as I am the current accountable officer for the NHS budget, as a, for the health budget as a whole. Um, the current chief executive took up post after I took up post, so that means it must have been in 2014, and has since then worked to resolve the issues that are described in the accounts because of certain accounting treatment that um, did not fully recognise, for example, I think as I've said, that there was £22 million of assets which were never going to realise £22 million. But on the other hand, the accounts, as I've also said, um, were unqualified every year. 
So, but somebody dropped the ball at some point before the current management were in place. Do you accept that? I'm thinking about your question, Mr. Kerr. I think it's a fair question. Um, what I'm reluctant, why I'm doubtless looking a bit reluctant here is, I think that people, if they are to be held to account, ought to be allowed to answer for themselves. So if the committee feels that there is someone who should be held to account, then they would need to ask to see them, I suppose. Is that, I, I, I'm not trying to avoid your question. I, I think that's, you, no, that, that is a fair answer, Mr. Yeah. Gray. I do, uh, I do accept what you're uh, saying to me. But I would like to just look at uh, the current management then, uh, because we heard at the session in Dundee that there was an element of performance-related pay made to a number of senior individuals. Uh, and I recall questioning that fairly closely. Yeah. Do you have a view on, given, given some of the issues that have been raised and some of the challenges going forward, do you have an issue, uh, uh, a view on performance-related pay having been paid to the current senior staff? Well, I discussed this, uh, as you would expect, before the, the committee uh, hearing with my workforce director, <coughs> who happens to be behind us at the moment. Um, I think I'd like to write to the committee about the way in which the pay system in the NHS operates, but um, again, I will seek to answer your direct question. Every person in the NHS in Scotland uh, could have access, in, in the cohort that we're speaking about, could have access to two things. They could have access to an increment so an annual increment and a performance bonus. Performance bonuses are not currently paid and have not been for some time. So the, 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 they don't, they're not in payment. In order to receive an increment, you need to have your performance at a level that is at least satisfactory. That is what happened in, to the two individuals, I think you questioned that, is to say the Chief Executive and the Finance Director, their performance was judged by the board to be satisfactory and they re therefore received a pay increment. Just forgive my clarification, but do, do you sit on that board? Do you, who no. makes that judgment? The, the judgment is made by the board. And can you help me with that constitution? Who, who, who constitutes that board? So there is a remuneration committee at the um, at a health board. Um, the finance director will be appraised by the chief executive, and the chief executive will be appraised by the chair. Oh, the chief finance director is appraised by the chief executive of NHS Tayside. That's correct. And the chief executive of NHS Tayside is appraised by the chair of NHS Tayside. That's correct. On whether their performance has been satisfactory. That, that's correct. The, uh, do you consider uh, that given that you've been providing, I think the words you used were tailored support to the board yep. for some time, and will continue to do so, and that we heard from Mr. Beattie that uh, in our last session, there were a number of issues raised uh, in terms of culture and relations and things. Do you consider that satisfactory? You've been very fair, Mr. Kerr, in your um, acceptance of my previous response about holding to account. I think, I hope you will be fair again. I'm sure you will be. I don't conduct performance appraisals in public, I don't think people would expect me to do so. Tell me something, just, hmm. uh, just for my interest, did any of the nursing staff get any form of performance related pay? Or is it just the senior staff who are eligible for 
satisfactory uplifts? Well, the senior staff are part of the senior manager's pay cohort. The nursing staff are part of a different pay cohort, but the, the chief nursing officer could assist you with so that. So the director of nursing would be in the executive, the senior management cohort, so mm -hmm. the director of nursing would be subject to the same uh, performance assessment as, as the other executives, and therefore nurses automatically have their increment uh, when they're on a pay scale uh, within the, the NHS rather than, than have it through performance. So all of the nurses who weren't at the top of their pay scale would automatically receive an increment and, and progress up the pay scale. The nurses who are on executive pay scale and certainly the director of nursing would be on that, um, would be subject to the same performance um, appraisal system as, as the other executives. Mr Gray, uh, Professor Connell, the chair of NHS Tayside, told us in December that um, the senior staff, their performance payments are subject to approval um, of a national performance management committee. Who sits on that committee? Um, uh, convener, I'm not going to do that from memory, but I will give you the information. But if you're asking me if I do, then the answer is no, I don't. Okay. Um, he also said they will be awarded an uplift in their pay, which is reviewed and approved centrally by the ministerial committee. Are you aware if a minister sits on that committee? No, I'm not, to be honest. So I would, I would, I'll need to, I'll need to write to you about that. And I, I am not aware of pay of this nature going to ministers. Ministers set the pay policy but they don't make judgments on individual salaries. Mm -hmm. It's just in, uh, I'm just curious. I mean, this issue, we've got a huge financial deficit in HST side. We've got a financial crisis. I can't think of another word for it. We've got senior managers who've been responsible for that, who have been awarded uh, pay, and Colin Beattie said, for an acceptable performance, not for an outstanding performance, because actually the finances are in crisis, but they have awarded each other performance bonuses, and that has been signed off by a committee, presumably in Edinburgh, but we don't really know who that's been signed off for. John Connell said himself, it's approved centrally by the ministerial committee, which suggests to me that a minister of government sits on the committee. But if you can maybe clarify that for us. I'm very pleased to clarify that. It's not a ministerial committee. It's the National Performance Management Committee. Okay. Um, and, and I do want also to clarify, they were not awarded performance bonuses. There are no performance bonuses in payment in the NHS in Scotland. Whatever, whatever the payments were called, they totaled £87,000 to NHS T side from their budget. That was the evidence that, that, that John Connell gave us. Did you want to come back in, Mr. Kerr? Not on that point. No, we'll come in. Okay. I, so I just want to move on to quite a specific issue, if I may. Just I've been asking questions of the government and not been getting answers, so this would be my opportunity. Uh, you'll be aware of the recent decision to close the Mulberry unit at Stracathro Hospital. Uh, are you aware of any other units in the portfolio uh, that are similarly likely to close, whether temporarily or permanently, in the near future? Not at this time, but uh, again, that will be part of what I'll be discussing with the Chair and the Chief Executive. I'm not aware at this time of proposals to close other units. However, I am aware that the uh, asset footprint of NHS Tayside is very substantial, and as we've already said, some are being sold. I would expect over time they may want to consolidate some of the units uh, as part of a better service to the public, frankly, particularly when you're looking at some quite old units. That, that's, uh, that's obviously a concern. Uh, is, is there any move? Stracathro Hospital, to take that as a particular example, doesn't have a great deal left in it, uh, and it's uh, an ageing asset. Uh, are there any plans, or the direction of travel would appear to be that Stracathro Hospital might not have a future. Could you tell us clearly whether that is what the people up there can expect? I'm not aware of any plans to close Stracathro Hospital. Uh, final question on that, and indeed my final question. Uh, when the Mulberry unit was closed, it was made very clear that this was a temporary closure. Uh, are you able to tell me, uh, temporary implies a short period 
and it will then reopen. Are you able to tell me if that is the case and when it will reopen? I'm not able to tell you when it will reopen, but I'm happy to get you that information. I'd be very grateful. Thank you. Ross Thompson. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, at the beginning of the session, um, it was said that NHS Tayside are experiencing a time lag on the cultural change for prescribing savings. During the evidence session that we had in Dundee, uh, Leslie McLay said, in relation to uh, questions around about that, that there had been national evidence that people had been uh, stocking up on excess drugs. Um, and surely, um, obviously, prescribers should know that patients should have enough, am you know, enough and ample um, medicines to see them through a, a winter uh, and not to stockpile it up. Um, can you explain to me why people are being allowed to stock up? Well, <clears throat> the, the, there are a number of reasons for that, and I might bring the CNO at some, uh, just briefly uh, after I've said a couple of things. Uh, to be simple about it, um, Mr. Thompson, it's not exactly a question of allowing people to stockpile. If, if people come back for medication not having used what they've already been prescribed uh, and their prescription is on a repeat, so in other words, um, I mean, to be very simple about it, I, I have a repeat prescription for medication. Uh, I pick it up from uh, the local pharmacy once every two months. And if I don't take anything in that two-month period, then that, that is, in a sense, a choice I have made. Now, the issue is the points at which the pharmacist or the GP or someone else might, might routinely review that to ensure I'm taking the medication. So I, th I think I, I, I'd, be, I'd be anxious to avoid the, the proposition that we were somehow allowing people to stockpile, but it is a question of what people do as individuals to comply with the medication regime they're on and also the steps we take to ensure that they are. But the Chief Nursing Officer may have something to add. I, I think Mr Gray ha has covered that. Clearly we would encourage people to manage their own health and therefore contact their surgery for a repeat prescription. In particular, over holiday periods, then we do encourage people to make sure they have enough medicine uh, to, to cover them over that holiday period. Um, as part of the government's plan in terms of the primary care development plan, there's a commitment to increase the number of specialist pharmacists available within surgeries. And they, in conjunction with the, the GP and the practice nurse, um, will <coughs> review um, what medication uh, patients have in partnership with their patients so that the best possible care can be delivered to their patients. So there is an element of encouraging patients to make sure they have sufficient medicine, uh, but equally um, practices do monitor um, when people are having repeat prescriptions. And, and at times they may not issue the prescription if they feel it's not appropriate, um, or they would have a note for the patient to come in to, to the surgery. Thank you. It's part of that change uh, program and trying to deliver a cultural change as well. Um, we've seen that in NHS Tayside agency staff reliance has increased by about 39 per cent and in the roundtable evidence session that we had prior to the hearing that we, we heard from a number of the stakeholders about a, a revolving door of people who were leaving the NHS but then returning back as agency. Um, so what sort of work are, are you doing round about identifying why it is that people are leaving the NHS, um, why they're then coming back um, as agency, why some people are maybe applying for posts but then maybe not taking them up. So just to get an, an understanding from you about what work's being done on that ground. I'll ask the Chief Nursing Officer to say something about that. I think there was some evidence about people sometimes finding agency work um, more flexible and uh, also better paid. Um, set against that, there is the value that some people attach to having permanent employment with personal development and training as part of that and having you know, a regular source of income. So these are choices that people make, but obviously we want employers of NHS staff in Scotland to be as attractive as possible uh, so that people do take up um, permanent employment with them, but the CNO will have more to add. And I think there's a number of, of, of pieces of work that we're doing nationally and regionally, but also Tayside are doing locally. 
So we have had the National Return to Practice programme and that will be consolidated within Tayside so that the local university will have that to support nurses who are, who are currently living in, in Tayside who want to come back to work to, to be able to do that and to be able to do that locally. I think the board nurse director, along with other um, of the, the senior team within Tayside, are proactively looking at you know, where the, the, there are people who are actively leaving and, uh, and, and trying to keep them coming back. And I think they're, they're recognising that because of the wide geography, there are some solutions that work in Dundee, but they don't work in Perth. So they're looking at bespoke responses to support um, patient care by having the right number of nurses. I think we have very flexible policies, so we have PIN policies within NHS Scotland that support very flexible working, annualised hours, term time working, and again, the, the board is, is being very proactive in making sure that staff are fully supported to, to come in and, and supported with shift patterns that, that suit the patients, but also suit the nurses. Um, we, we are looking at the non-contract agency, and again, in working in the big urban corner basins, the central belt. Running out of time, can I ask you to keep your answer con as concise as possible, Absolutely. please? Thank you. Um, so looking at, at looking at the contract to reduce the, the reliance on non-contract agency, and indeed we've seen significant improvement um, over the past month or two when the board have, have reduced non-contract agency and absolutely bringing people back into NHS employment. More uh, questions, uh, convener. Um, in, in answer to the question by Colin Beattie, you wrote about staff and staff um, morale. Um, you know, Mr. Gray spoke about something which he thought had been improving and having meetings uh, with staff and, and with the minister. And, and I know myself um, being involved in a, a council zone well, at the top of an organisation, um, or with your with politicians or ministers, it's very easy sometimes to get in, involved in a bubble sometimes. And um, the evidence session that we had in Dundee, um, stakeholders again like um, Bob McGlashan were telling us that staff morale is getting less and less, staff do not feel valued, there is a big stress for uh, the nursing family, um, Raymond Marshall said that admin staff had been an easy target with them feeling frustrated and constrained, that the relationship between managers and staff was not good and had gotten worse and that, and again to quote him, that there was no trust. Um, if we're going to deliver that cultural change, there has to be confidence and trust between staff and management. Um, what role will you be playing in ensuring that um, there is engagement with staff uh, and that you can command the confidence of staff in taking mm -hmm. forward what's going to be a really challenging agenda around about cultural change and savings to be made? I'll be brief, convener. Um, We've already, as I've said, provided support. We've had uh, considerable help uh, from Norman Proven of the Royal College of Nursing. And I did speak to individual staff side representatives when I was at the most recent annual review, because I accept your point. You can sometimes get a helicopter view and not see underneath it. So, I mean, I've, I've taken these steps myself. Uh, Shirley Rogers, our Director of Workforce, has been in regular contact with George Doherty, the director of HR, as well as with Norman Proven and others to ensure that we're, we're continuing to develop. Um, so I, I think my short answer is this is something we continue to take seriously because the quality of industrial relations in Tayside is critical to the delivery of some of their plans. Thank you very much. Um, my last question, convener, uh, which is brief. I know we've you do, Mr. Thompson. Um, I'm not, I've decided not to take item three this morning. I understand there are people in the gallery waiting for item three. It's just to let you know. We'll come back to it at a later session, but I think since this evidence, and it is important, has run on, I think, and we're aware that you need to leave by half past ten, Mr. Gray, so I will not take item three this morning. Mr. Thompson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, we've talk, talked about uh, the last four years um, in NHS Tayside, but as came out in the evidence session um, about 15 years ago, a tax, task force uh, was produced with a series of recommendations about avoiding the, sort of the very financial situation that NHS Tayside has found itself in. And I appreciate your response to Colin Beattie when you spoke about that you want organisations uh, and boards to be transparent. Um, in my view, in listening to that, transparency is not an option. It's, it's his duty, um, and 
I, I know way do I feel I should be grateful to NHS Tayside for, for being transparent, because they should be. Uh, but what I'm struggling to see is the accountability side. And I've been listening to the responses to both Colin Beattie and to Liam Kerr. And the way I can articulate this is this has happened over a number of years. It's like driving over towards a cliff edge, like a Thelma and Louise style financial cliff edge, where there are those in the driver's seat who know the direction of travel and have pushed the accelerator, knowing that that will be the end result. And I'm trying to understand where in the organization that those who've been driving the car over that period of time, knowing where it was going to take the organization, are going to be held to account. And if there's going to be any investigation from your own side uh, into those who have been responsible. I mean, I've heard very clearly what, what Mr Kerr has said and what you have said. I will reflect on that, but as I have also said, I think it is difficult to hold to account people who are not there and also to look back at decisions which were taken, for example, about assets, which in the light of today's economic circumstances now turn out to be wrong, you know, we would have to reflect on whether they were wrong at the time that they were taken. I think what I would reiterate is that those who are in the leadership positions now are taking their roles very seriously indeed and seeking to make progress, and I believe they're doing that. But I, I accept the concern the committee has raised. I've heard it. We have three additional points sure. from members. I ask members to keep answers very pointed and short, uh, and uh, the witnesses to do so as well. Gail Ross. It's just a really small point on the prescribing issue. Um, I've been a dispenser and worked in a number of pharmacies, and I know that a lot of times you get the prescription and it's for the brand drug rather than the generic, and the brand drug can cost quite a lot more. Um, is that part of the reason for the, the cost of the prescribing, or is it an escalating cost of medicines, or is it both, or can you come back to me on the detail with that? I'm happy to come back to you on the detail once the Deputy Chief Medical Officer has had the opportunity to review this. I think that's probably the most helpful to the committee if, if they were content with that. Thank you. Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. A short time after we went to Dundee and took evidence in December, we read newspaper reports that the committee had sought external advice to prepare itself for a question and answer session with ourselves. In fact, the report said that Professor Connell had invited a former member of this committee to Nine Wells Hospital. Um, given that we're just asking people questions about their job and their duties, and they know that better than anyone else, why would they need to get external help to come here? Well, I think... I'll give, I'll give you three very short answers to that question. The first thing is you'd have to ask them. The second is, I prepare for these committees. I, take, I, I think there is probably not much in my job that I take more seriously than coming to a committee of the parliament. So actually, I, I, I would always encourage anyone within a health board to prepare properly. How they decide to do that is, is of course, a matter for them. And, and my third answer is, some people find this stressful, and therefore I think they probably use whatever help they feel they can get. If I'm be, if I not that it happens often now, if I'm being ha interviewed for a job, I always rehearse and I always rehearse in front of other people. That's what I do. On that vein, then. In terms of other preparations that, that were made in advance of, of our meeting, were Scottish Government officials involved in the preparations for the, the witnesses? Yes, of course, and I would expect them to be. So what was the nature of that? So, uh, discussing the current state of the accounts, the, dis the current state of the delivery plan, ensuring that the... Um, those who were appearing in front of the committee were thinking about what sorts of issues the committee might want to cover. I mean, I think it's a matter of respect for the committee to be to, to come along um, with some uh, at least idea in your mind about about what sorts of issues the committee might want to raise. I, I would I would think it was falling short of someone's duty if they didn't prepare to come to a committee. So were witnesses <coughs> rehearsing and preparing? 
for questions and answers with Scottish Government officials ahead of our meeting? Not as, as far as I know in terms of specific questions and answers, but in the same way as I did. I mean, I spent time in advance of this committee going through the various parts of briefing about NHS Tayside, about their current situation, reading the transcripts of the previous uh, committee appearances. Okay. Um, I think that would yeah, be normal just, practice. Just to clarify then, so ahead of the 15th of December meeting, apart from Mr Dawn, which I'm taking from newspaper reports, who else assisted the, the witnesses in their preparations for the committee? I'm looking Sorry? for names. Sure, well, they, they spoke to John Connach and the Chief Operating Officer, who's part of their tailored support. They spoke to Christine McLaughlin, do, do the Finance Director. Um, talk through. As, as Paul said, it's really to try to make sure that they are very focused and making sure they're giving you clear, straightforward, simple answers to, to questions. But yes, we, we, it, it's not something that felt an unusual thing to do. And as Paul said, it is about trying to make sure that you are as uh, giving the evidence that committees are, are looking for. Thank you, Mayor. Just as an aside there, I wish at the December meeting the auditors had been a bit better prepared when they arrived on the scene. However, um, Mr Gray, in your submission to us, you talk about uh, reducing spending in areas such as agency costs for nursing, and you make a specific mention of that. In the written submission from the Royal College of Nursing, uh, which we looked at in December, they make the point decisions were taken not to employ agency staff, which results in regular staff not being able to take annual leave. Now, is that is that been exacerbated by apparently a drive down again on agency staff, or has that been compensated by hiring staff into vacant positions? So the NHS Teesside were successful in recruiting an additional 211 uh, new graduates over the autumn. And whilst our, our new graduates are, are fantastic, they obviously need to work for a number of years to get the experience. So it's important there's a balance of experience and, and new registered nurses there delivering care. The board nurse director has also um, been putting work in to make sure that allocation of annual leave is even so that there aren't the peaks and troughs of, of needing additional staff. And I would expect that a uh, a proportionate approach is taken. It's important that staff have their annual leave and have that within the year. So I would expect all staff to be able to take their annual leave um, in, in conjunction and, and with agreement with their line manager uh, at a time that's appropriate for their personal life, but, but also the work. So I would expect people within the year to be able to take their annual leave. Um, I would expect um, reduction of agency staff because that's not best value and it's not best for patients. And the board is being proactive, as I say, they've brought in an additional 211 uh, new graduates uh, over the autumn. The, the RCN make the point that planned annual leave couldn't be taken. Now, clearly you have an expectation that that isn't the case, but do you actually know the facts on the ground. I don't know whether that actually happened or not. I'm assuming if the RCN said that, they had the evidence to do that. But again, we'd be happy to provide a written update on the, the position we are just now with the, the taking of annual leave for staff. So the two key things here are that, uh, the, the, that the, the reduction in the, in the hiring of agency staff doesn't impact on the patient experience. And secondly, of course, importantly, that the nursing staff are not being disadvantaged because of it. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm happy to, I would, I would expect it to, to an overall enhancement, but I'm happy to provide a further evidence written to make sure, to confirm to you that uh, staff are, are having their annual leave. Okay, thank you. Convener, thank you. I should also say in response to Ms Lennon's question, I speak to every chair and chief executive before they come to a committee. I do that routinely. At our December meeting, Mr Neil was asking about agency costs, so we all were. But Mr Neil said when he was Health Secretary that he was seeking um, to put an agency function inside the NHS so that any profit could be recycled inside the NHS. What happened to that initiative? I'll come, come to the Chief Nursing Officer. We do, of course, have bank staff, which is effectively our own bank of agency that. staff. Yes. 
Fiona. So, so what, whilst I can't say <coughs> and what specifically happened to the, the, the work with, with Mr Neil did, but what we're currently doing just now... But why can't you say what happened to that work? Because I, I don't know. I'm happy to provide a written response to that. Do any of you know what happened to that initiative? No, I don't. I mean, I, I, I um, wasn't aware of it, to be honest, until Mr Neil mentioned it. But mm. uh, as, I, as I say, my response would be that we have bank staff, which is in effect the, aid, the agency within the NHS. But, but what we are currently doing is working um, with NSS and boards to put in uh, a national bank and because one of the problems is although we have local NHS board banks, um, it sometimes makes it difficult for someone to work in Lothian and Fife without being part of, of two separate banks. So we are putting both national and regional banks in that would essentially um, do what the work of a national agency would do and we're currently working on that just now. Okay, but that won't replace the agency. We You'll still allow agency nurses to be used in NHS Scotland. We would expect that to replace agency. Um, What's the time scale staff. for that? I'm not familiar with the time scale. That's the work that's ongoing, but we could certainly give you that. Um, if you expect scale. that initiative to replace reliance on agency, will there come a point where NHS, you as the chief executive, Mr. Gray, NHS Scotland, say? This this is working. We no longer can, you, you know, spend three times as much on agency nurses. Yes, we've. I've made clear to uh, NHS board chief executives and chairs through what we call our Once for Scotland initiative that, and this is as good an example as any. Once we agree on a way that things are to be done, then we will we will reach a point of mandating it. So yes, is the answer. Okay. Do you have a time scale for that? For this specific issue? <clears throat> yes. No, I don't. Okay. Um, Mr Gray, you said right at the start uh, in your uh, opening statement that you were meeting with the Chair and the Chief Executive on the 31st of March um, to discuss... No, the beginning of March. Oh, you are. The, the beginning of March, sorry. At the start of yes. March. Okay, that's fine. I'm just conscious that we are taking evidence from them on the 30th of March, so it would be useful if... You could meet with them in advance of that, but that sounds as if it is going to happen in advance of committee. C certainly, and I, I think I also undertook to write to the committee with any update that would bear on what I gave in my initial written submission to you following that meeting. So Thank I, you. I will follow that through. Thank you. Can I ask a final question about NRAC funding? I think NHS Tayside's NRAC funding has been at a higher level. Is that projected? You said they were getting an extra eight million this year. Is that higher in percentage terms than other boards? So the, the, the formula is um, updated when there's new data and, and the, the work of the, the um, team involved in that had made, made a change to the acute um, morbidity and life circumstances that probably not sufficient time to explain all of that, but the, some of the conditions in the formula change from next financial year. That, that's led to a few boards um, changing their position on, in, in funding. Um, so Tayside wasn't the only board that, that benefited. NHS 5, for instance, um, moved further to, to receive that. The reason I'm saying that to you is that, uh, that was a one-off change. Um, and so unless there was to be a significant population change, I wouldn't expect a further movement for Tayside. So, so we've said to them, plan on the basis of the eight million pounds recurring from next year, but I'm, I'm not expecting there to be a further, a further movement, but that would be d determined purely really by population for the next few years. Give me, I'm not clear on that if, um, I want to know if Tayside's uplift, NRAC uplift is higher in percentage terms than other boards. Yeah, in, sorry, NRAC funding is only given to boards that are more than 1% behind um, what the formula says that they should get, so not all boards get NRAC okay. funding. Um, so there was £50 million pounds that we put into NRAC funding for next year. Tayside received £8 million So of, of the that. boards that are receiving NRAC funding, is Tayside's the highest? No. No, no, it's not. It's, it's, it's actually one of the lower ones. So NHS Lothian is at the, the higher end in, in funding for that. But I can give you the breakdown of the boards and what they've received. But Tayside is £8 million of fifty. Yeah, but effectively the Scottish Government are giving NHS Tayside NRAC funding to repay money that they're owed to the Scottish Government. It's a bit of a 
cycle. It, it, it is, and, and again, coming back to the transparency point, the, the getting it for a purpose, and the purpose is because the funding formula suggests that they um, are, are, are eligible for that funding, so we're still giving them the funding because it is something that in the longer term should be part of their baseline position. It keeps them at 1% below their funding level, so consistent with all other boards. Um, but there's nothing that I foresee, um, unless there is a significant population change, that would move them beyond the position they're currently in. Can I thank all three of you very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I'm sure we will come back to this at a later date. Um, I now move the committee into private session. Thank you. <laughs>